All right, y'all, welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and the brand new Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. And I've recorded more than 5,500 interviews since 2003, almost all on foreign policy and all available for you at scotthorton.org. You can sign up for the podcast feed there. And the full interview archive is also available at youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show. All right, you guys, on the line, I've got Kit Clarenberg from The Gray Zone. That's thegrayzone.com, and he's got this really important piece with Tom Secker called Declassified Intelligence Files Expose Inconvenient Truths of Bosnian War. Welcome to the show, Kit. How are you doing? Hey, how's it going, Scott? Uh, it's going really good. Listen, you're in my book twice. Uh, one of them is where I went through and plagiarized all your work on this great article. But the other one is uh, all about the CIA and George Soros and the NED backing the Ukraine coup of 2014, where you did a really great piece on your Substack um, detailing all of that. You know, a lot of times people kind of know that well, this sure looks like a NED type of situation, but they need all the details nailed down, and you sure did a hell of a great job doing that. So, um, well, thank you very much. I mean, I wasn't actually aware of that, and I'm, I'm always reminded of Oscar Wilde's quote that you know, to lose one parent is can be regarded as misfortune. Uh, to lose both looks like carelessness. So, I mean, to be quoted by you twice, Scott, is an honor. <laughs> That's funny. I like that. Well, he had some good quips, that guy. Uh, you know, he we did. might talk about that in a minute, but let's talk about this Bosnia thing. Um, you know, I uh, interviewed Max Blumenthal yesterday about the upcoming anti-war protest, and your article was mentioned here, your work here, and and we both agree, both of us were too young to have really been up to date on the Bosnia War as it happened. I don't know about Max. I was good and paying attention on Kosovo in 99, but in Bosnia, I've had to go back and learn as much as I could from reading Naboj Samalik and so forth. Um, and in fact, recently I found a really good one, a series by Edward S. Herman, the co-author of Manufacturing Consent with Noam Chomsky. And he had this thing in something called The Monthly Review. There's a three or four part essay where he really takes you through the Bosnia War step by step and shows how, well, as you guys seem to reveal here, it was just as screwed up a war and based on just as much dishonesty as all the rest of the wars of our era, Kosovo, Iraq, Syria, or the rest. Is that pretty much your take, too? Absolutely. And I think that, I mean, one of the reasons that these files which were released, they are the uh, they are intelligence cables that were sent by Canadian peacekeeping troops posted to Bosnia in 1992. One of the reasons they are so revealing and, and, and so important is they offer this you know, first-hand view of of the reality on the ground and you know it becomes very clear that there was a huge gulf between what people were being told at home and indeed you know yeah the the, the reality but and i think as i mean you mentioned subsequent conflicts i i, I i'm convinced that the, the bosnian war was an intended kind of laboratory experiment like a petri dish where various strategies were trialed or refined and honed. And then this has kind of set a blueprint, this, this grinding conflict, and horrific, uh, has set a, um, a blueprint for subsequent interventions, whether that's Kosovo, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, um, you know, Libya, Syria, they tried multiple times and seem to have failed. I mean, it's, it, it's really revealing. You see the same kind of strategies you know, the same same propaganda, the same um, uh, you know abuse of local proxies, and um, yes, it, 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 and the same kind of lies being told in justification of, of of starting these wars and maintaining them. So yeah, from that perspective, I think even though the uh, the the, you know, the the article refers to events that are over you know, in some cases over twenty years uh, old now, it's never been more important to look at them you know, through a microscope. Mm -hmm. All right, so. If I've got the uh, Christian Amanpour version of this war straight, it's that Yugoslavia, after the fall of the Soviet Union and the fall of communism, started breaking up. And essentially the Serbs wanted to create a bigger 
greater Serbia at the expense of the Croatians and the Bosniaks and everybody else. And so then everybody else was defending themselves against this Serbian aggression. Is that not right? Well, I mean, yes, that's the, the, the you know, that's the established narrative of what happened then. And now, the reality is, of course, um, uh, yeah, in, completely divorced from that, and, and indeed far more nuanced. So, in the late 1980s, the National Endowment for Democracy, which is a a, a well established CIA front, um, began funding opposition groups and uh, you know, um, opposition media NGOs in the hope that um, you know, at the turn of the turn of the decade. Uh, in, in line with the collapse of uh, the Warsaw Pact countries, where the NED was also very active, um, uh, that Yugoslavia would implode into little, you know, easily manageable, easily exploited pieces. Um, at, at the same time, you had the CIA and MI6 that were, were funding and training and arming insurrectionary uh, nationalist groups within most of the republics, not, not Serbia, um, you know, rather markedly. And it was expected that, yes, that Yugoslavia would collapse into um, infighting and, and, and nationalism uh, you know, come 1990. This didn't actually happen because in Yugoslavia, uh, there was a very high standard of living and it was a truly unique system in world terms. I mean, we're talking about somewhere where a paid vacation um, housing, uh, healthcare, and education were all considered human rights. Um, yes, yeah, so I mean, people actually rather quite like like the system. It was also it, it very well integrated from an ethnic and kind of religious perspective. It was very common for you know there to be thoroughly mixed communities of people, uh, Catholics alongside Orthodox Christians, alongside Muslims, alongside Jews, all getting along. Um, and Bosnia, Bosnia was the kind of ne plus ultra of this. It was very, very, very diverse. Um, in every way, and you know, everyone kind of got, got along. You know, intermarrying was encouraged, and actually, um, when Yugoslavia did start breaking up, which we'll get into in a second, um, a, a variety of people from all over Yugoslavia, the kind of various uh, independent, sorry, the various uh, constituent republics, started moving to Bosnia en masse because they felt that there was no chance there could be, um, you know, uh, ethnic tension and warring there between the different factions. I mean, you know, sadly, how wrong they were. But anyway, so uh, in 1990, uh, President then President Bush um, uh, pushed pushed for the passing of a law called the appropriate the foreign appropriations act this cut off yugoslavia from all aid um and uh it precluded um, yugoslavia from trading with um, with credits which um you know effectively destroyed um uh, uh yugoslavia's exports and imports but also um it, it, it made presumption of aid contingent on each uh republic holding uh, a referendum um, on independence and shifting in a quote unquote democratic um, um, uh, direction. Uh, you know, and yes, the, the, all these kind of nationalist groups, which the CIA and M MI6 have been sponsoring, suddenly came to the fore as these you know, you know, crusading freedom fighters. In some cases, they were possessed of you know, tr really quite horrific and bizarre uh views you know they view in for instance in croatia uh tuchman who was a you know sort of nationalist thug uh who venerated the nazis in the astasha which was a, a croatian puppet state which was created by um uh created by hitler when they invaded uh yugoslavia in in the 40s and um the, the astasha the astasha typified themselves by engaging in brutality that shocked even the axis powers who were there i mean you know we're talking about skewer skewering infants on bayonets and all sorts of other you know just horrific um acts and so this uh, they were engaging in the same kind of rhetoric and indeed venerating these people in the modern day which made uh croatia's serbian population which was ran to hundreds of thousands of people extremely worried and you know with good reason um again in bosnia things were a bit different so while the US had sponsored a, um, I'm not sure, maybe nationalist is the wrong word, but uh, the, the Muslim leader is Begovic. Um, he had a history of um, issuing pamphlets and statements that were talking about the need for Bosnia to be um, religiously and culturally pure and you know, to drive out uh you know um uh christians and and, and jews and stuff um and uh, uh however because of its high level of 
diversity and integration, it was hoped that Bosnia might, um, you know, actually be, you know, be kept in Yugoslavia. So there was a provisional peace plan that was in, I think it was in 1991, one under which Bosnia would remain a sovereign independent state within the Federation of Yugoslavia, and it would be ceded uh, Muslim majority Serbian territory. Izbegovic initially supported this but then backed out and it's very it it, 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 it it would be unsurprising if this was due to US pressure um so I um, it, over the next kind of year year and a half you have building tensions and you know every side is kind of preparing for war the you know, the, the, the Croats the, the the Serbs and 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 the, the the Bosnian Muslims they were all all getting ready to start you know um kill, killing their neighbors as it were and so at the very last minute there was a peace plan um that, you know, that was drawn up by the European Commission, the forerunner of the EU. And again, it, it, it was attempting to maintain a, a balance where every ethnic group's rights and, and uh, would be protected and everyone could live al- alongside each other you know, peacefully. And, and this is the Lisbon plan that you're referring to? Yeah, 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 precisely. Okay. And, and and however, this was then torpedoed by Washington. Um, you know, uh, Warren Zimmerman, who was the US's ambassador to Bosnia, uh, met with Izbegovic and said, we will give you unconditional support if you uh, torpedo this deal and he did and then fighting breaks out within hours unbelievable yeah this is my big failure when i debated bill crystal someone in the audience asked him well when was the last successful intervention and he said bosnia and instead of me saying did you hear that everybody he can't stand by kosovo Iraq, Mm -hmm. Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, any of this, the surges, every bit of foreign policy that he supported for 20 years, he can't stand behind any of. He's got to go back to 1994. And then I didn't say that. You know what I said? I said, no, actually what happened was the U.S. Ambassador Zimmerman ruined the peace deal and prolonged the war. So I'm right and he's wrong. And Bosnia is not an example of successful American intervention in any sense, unless you just like seeing a couple of hundred thousand extra dead people for no reason. But I dropped the ball and I didn't hang him with the rope that he handed me, which was, wow, Bill Crystal cannot stand by any intervention at all. I went for the more particular point. But I mean, this is huge, right? I mean, the story there was this is genocide. This is like the return of the Nazis. They're slaughtering civilians by the hundreds of thousands. They're not just cleansing them, like force marching them. They're just shooting them all. And these Serbs, they must have been possessed by the devil himself. They're turning Europe completely upside down. And, you know, the French and the Germans and the British, why, they're too busy standing around with their hands in their pockets, not doing anything. And so America must intervene to save the poor people. That's the narrative from TV. Yeah, precisely. And it's, I mean, what what makes that narrative all the more perverse is that there were uh, large scale and 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 indeed routine massacres of Serbs and Croats by um, uh, by Muslim forces, uh, but but uh, but also as well, you know, a lot of the time when they were, were in the media when they were talking about Serbs, um, uh, you know, carrying out ethnic cleansing or or you know, kind of imperialist seizure uh, annexation of uh, of territory. I mean, yes, there was there was bloodletting on the Serb side, of course. Um, yeah, you know, this is a civil war. Um, you know, these things are not pretty. But a lot of the time they were simply trying to hang on to territory where they had uh, res- where Serbs had resided for centuries. They didn't want to get themselves be, you know, vanquished, you know, by force or by threat. So I I mean and yes, I mean you mentioned the US prolonging this. I think that's the key you know, something that's really key to consider here. So in um, it's very clear from the cables um, that at numerous points, the Serbs were very, very, very keen to um, reach a negotiated settlement. Um, you know, like Yugoslavia more generally had an interest in that because uh, they were subject to absolute crippling US sanctions while the war was ongoing, which led to um, you know a, a, a shortage of basic goods, you know, su- suicide skyrocketed, death from preventable diseases skyrocketed, uh, drug use skyrocketed. Um, you know, people that the, the, people would queue for hours to get a loaf of bread in a store, um, and it also um, galvanised and led to the rise of um, you know major like, mafia groups, which you know, dominated the country. So, yeah, you know, the, the Yugoslavia wanted out of this as quickly as possible, as did the Bosnian Serbs. But this was reported in the media 
as, well, the Serbs are intransigent and that they're being unreasonable and unbending in negotiations. Again, the cables make make clear that this is completely untrue. Um, it, I mean, again, I mean, you talk about Kosovo, that this is exactly what the KLA did. So um, Izbegovic and um, you know, the Muslim forces, their negotiating position, because they, they knew they had unconditional support from the US, um, which would endure, um, you know, as, as long as they needed it, refused to engage in constructive talks at all. They would say, well, we want everything that we want and we don't want you to get anything that you want, and we're not backing down from that. So, of course, the Serbs walk away, as you would, because that's not a negotiation. Um, and, but then, yes, this gets reported as, um, uh, you know, the Serbs are being unreasonable. And, I mean, again, we have seen this over and over and over again. In Kosovo, the KLA were explicitly told by the US side that, like, you know, it, the more deaths, you know, the more likely it is that we're going to intervene. And so... You know, in all in the run up to the war, numerous um, negotiations between the two sides, the KLA couldn't be less interested in peace. And actually, they had a very massive vested interest in more bloodshed. Uh, you know, but again, because because this narrative of Serb intransigence and Serb um, you know, genocidal designs had been minted in in Bosnia and throughout the nineties, it was a lot easier for people to be sold on this notion that it was Belgrade uh, that that was uh, holding holding back peace and, and on a war path. And again, yes, we've you know, we've seen this in in Afghanistan, in, in Iraq, Libya, over and over again. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's get a little bit specific on some of the revelations. There's some more of the revelations. Uh, from these documents. Um, I think one thing that's really important is the presence of the Mujahideen here. I mean, we know now that not only Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, but at least according to the 9-11 Commission, the San Diego cell, the Flight 77 hijackers, uh, Hamzmi, or Hamzi and Midhar, Hazmi and Midhar, uh, they yes. all three had fought in Bosnia on Bill Clinton's side on the bin Ladenite side. And that was where they kind of earned their stripes and credibility as Al Qaeda terrorists, uh, who then, you know, blew back and hit America just 10 years later. So, um, not even, so, um, I guess is, is yeah, there, first yeah, of all, sure. is there anything in the cables, you know, really detailing like, Hey, a plane full of guys from Afghanistan just got here and stuff like that. Or any, anything about like all those Iranian arms shipments that Bill Clinton helped arrange for the Mujahideen then? Absolutely. And I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a very interesting aspect related to 9-11 um, of the Bosnian War, which again we'll get into. But yes, I mean, the, the Mujahideen are never referred to by name. The cables, you know, universally use the phrase the phrase the, phrase, the Muslims. But yeah, the, the, I mean, so from from the latter half of 1992, um, CIA black flights flown into Bosnia would deposit Mujahideen fighters from all over the world, particularly Afghanistan, of course, and um, also you know, weapons in breach of a UN embargo. So, I mean, this was, you know, completely perverse and illegal on every conceivable level. Um, but yes, I mean, the, the, the Mujahideen arrived, they, gave, they quickly gained a reputation for um, absolute brutality and, you know, for a to total disregard for their own safety. But also, it's clear from the files, um, if you read between the lines, they were carrying out false flag attacks on their own, on, on, Bos on Bosnians. They were killing Muslims and claiming that it was the Serbs in order to trigger uh, US intervention. Uh, in order to, you know, uh, add to this media perception that the Serbs were the bad guys. Um, and there's all sorts of uh, kind of parenthetical or or oblique references to how um, the, the, the 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 Muslims, quote unquote, but it's the Mujahideen have um, sought to uh, provoke uh, overreactions from the uh, Serbs. So you know, during uh, during ceasefires, they would attack Serb civilians in the hope that the same would happen to Muslim civilians in Bosnia. Um, you know, it's really it's really quite horrific. And um, they were they were clearly uh, there, there's a, an amazing e e excerpt where they refer to how. David Owen, who was this kind of veteran British politician, former foreign secretary, who served as the European community's lead negotiator in Yugoslavia, um, uh, it, it, there's a cable that states that he's been condemned to death for being responsible for the deaths of 130,000 Muslims in Bosnia, and this was passed down by an honour court. Um, it, yeah, I mean, this is again a, a nakedly a reference to um, the Mujahideen, uh, and it's, it's. I mean, that's never been mentioned in the, in, in the media before. But I mean, I, I, I dare say that his life was probably 
you know, very you know, very seriously in danger you know, and, you know as a result these people were completely crazy and they were you know, they're acting with you know to total uh, with zero compunction um, uh, about human life whatsoever and uh, yeah i mean it, it, i mean nowhere near 130,000 people total let alone muslims died in in the bosnian war i mean one a cynic might suggest it was because he was very very critical publicly of the us role um, and what the us was and how the us was sabotaging peace talks you know needlessly prolonging this at, at an immeasurable human cost um and th th so for instance and I mean, I talked about the 9-11 parallel. What's really quite eerie is that when the, the, a peace deal was finally struck, um, you know, the, the, the dates and accords, which was the, you know, the US, US uh, uh, run negotiations, which have, have left you know, Bosnia in a complete, a, com a complete state politically ever since, um, pretty much immediately the Mujahideen's leadership, this is documented in the cables, start getting assassinated. And this is actually, this was, this happened in Afghanistan as well. Hmm. Um, once the Soviets were vanquished, uh, the less hardline elements of the, of the Mujahideen, like Abdullah Hazam, who was saying, well, our work here is done. We should not get involved in running this country, our interests not in politics, started dying in, in car bomb attacks and getting, you know, attacked by un unknown, killed by unknown snipers, which raises the question of whether the CIA was behind this. I mean, it, it certainly seems the case in, in, um, in, in Bosnia, because um, there's one, there's an account from one, um, which is uh, not in the cables, but a, a, a contemporary account from one Bosnian Mujahideen fighter, which is that suddenly uh, they became unwelcome in Bosnia, and the you know the CIA effectively put out a burn notice on them. M many of them tried to flee to Albania and Kosovo to you know fight alongside the KLA, another CIA-backed militia, but they were stopped in the process and you know, in many cases deported back back to their home countries many of them were executed for terrorism offenses it was this quote-unquote betrayal that led bin laden to uh publish his fat war on america which one way or another leads to 9 11. um so i mean and, and in terms of historical parallels sorry i mean what um the contemporary parallels i, I think it's in that's very interesting to consider because in Ukraine, uh, well, even long before the war started, in fact, throughout the Cold War, um, but, you know, with greater intensity once the Berlin Wall fell, the CIA was funding and sponsoring and, and um, encouraging nationalist elements within Ukraine because they felt they were the best bulwark against Soviet power. Um, it, 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 of course, uh, you know, after the Maidan coup, which was, uh, the, you know, the, the protesters were riddled with nationalist elements, um, the Azov Battalion has become extremely extremely powerful and important, as have many other uh, far-right uh, parliamentary elements like like, uh, like right sector. Now, it, it, it seems fairly inevitable that um, the Russia is going to prevail um, in, in in the conflict due to the due to the, their sheer the sheer size of their their, their military and their their vast um, artillery and and, and and weapon advantage. Now. It would be unsurprising if a lot of these Azov rats start fleeing a, a sinking ship at some point and, you know, scattering all over Europe and maybe North America too. That means that there will be a large number of battle-hardened, embittered, rabid neo-Nazis um, with a penchant for brutality walking among us. Yep. And, you know, the, the, the likelihood that they will carry out a revenge attack. I mean... My friend uh, Alex Rubenstein recently for the Grey Zone revealed how a Azov-linked uh, far-right terror cell in Italy was right. planning terrorist attacks and got busted by the police. I know, it's already started. No... I, it's just like, yeah, in, and it's, know, well, in, I remember, in fact, 10 years ago, the first ISIS attack in Europe, they attacked a Jewish museum in Brussels. And it's like, guys, this is, <laughs> are you sure you don't want to call this off right now? Give me just a minute here. At the Libertarian Institute, we publish books, real good ones. So far, we've got Will Griggs' No Quarter, Sheldon Richmond's Coming to Palestine, and What Social Animals Owe to Each Other, and four of mine, Fool's Aaron, Enough Already, The Great Ron Paul, and my brand new one, Hotter Than the Sun, Time to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. And I'm happy to announce that we've just published our managing editor Keith Knight's first one, The Voluntarist Handbook an excellent collection of essays by the world's greatest libertarian thinkers and writers, including me. Check them all out at libertarianinstitute.org slash books. And for a limited time, signed copies of Enough Already and Hotter Than the Sun are available at scotthorton.org slash books.
Hey guys, I have some wasps in my house, so I shot them to death with my trusty Bug Assault 3.0 model with the improved salt reservoir and bar safety. I don't have a deal with them, but the show does earn a kickback every time you get a Bug Assault or anything else you buy from Amazon.com by way of the link in the right-hand margin on the front page at scotthorton.org. So keep that in mind. And don't worry about the mess. Your wife will clean it up. It's funny because if you go back one year ago, I, you know, I'm writing this book, so I have a whole collection of quotes of all these smart guys saying, yeah, what we'll do in Ukraine is we'll replicate the 1980s Afghan war. Even though, and, and they, you know, they say over and over again, it just this is four or five months after America's final humiliating defeat and withdrawal from Afghanistan after supposedly fighting the consequences of the last time that they did this. So the question is, like, who's going to be Osama bin Laden? Will it be Yarash or Beletsky, who will be, you know, the worst Nazi that our government has to use as an excuse for its next stage of intervention in Europe seven, eight, ten years from now? Uh, could, it, could it be Zelensky? I mean, he's been growing that beard. You know, I mean, he looks suitably sinister. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, if so, I mean, that's something that is something to consider. And like, you know, I mean, I've traveled extensively around the, you know, the Balkans. I call it, I call it home now. Um, I, in mo most cities I've been to, I have spoken to people who are, you know, in their late twenties or early thirties who remember very well. Um, well, you know, until relatively recently, um, you know, weapons like AK-47s being openly sold um, on the streets, you know, and, and as easy to purchase as, you know, a can of Coke is today. So, I mean, that I think that, you know, we know for a fact that there is an enormous amount of fraud and corruption and and, uh, and theft of of the you know this vast groundswell of Western weapons, which have been flooding into Kiev completely unaccountably since since before this even started. Um, there there are account, accounts by uh, people who fought the Foreign Legion, the mercenaries, who uh, where they say that you know it was highly professionalized, where whereby a van carrying weapons would arrive and then another a van completely unmarked would arrive and take half of the shipment and drive off and you know command the officers and the SBU didn't want to know about it and indeed um you know there were there were punishments like being sent on suicide missions for anyone who made it too big a stink about it so yeah that, i mean that's that that's a, a very very key parallel i mean i think another Thing to bear in mind is the yes i mentioned false flag attacks this is a recurring theme in the files now in february 1994 there was an absolutely horrific attack on a civilian market in bosnia and it, it, it killed 68 people and it injured uh, at least 144 and you can find footage of, of, of it online and it's just it's uh you know absolutely shocking but responsibility for the attack and and how it was perpetrated is still um, effectively unproven um it, and it's been hotly contested ever since the un at the time was unable to make an attribution there were multiple official investigations which couldn't reach a definitive conclusion on 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 who or what fired uh, sorry who, who fired or what was fired um canadian troops at the time uh you know, the, these peacekeepers were utterly convinced that there was a very very high chance that it was a false flag and they talk about how well it's quite disturbing that there were you know that there were so many muslim soldiers on the site at the time and um they you know, directing journalists seen very 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 quickly not trying to you know seize evidence or or protect people but they wanted they wanted this to be seen now again it, it states in, in the cables we know the muslims have fired on their own civilians and um, in the past in order to gain media attention and have pl planted high explosives in their own positions and then detonated them um while the media watches claiming they're being bombarded by the serbs now i don't make a judgment on what did or did not happen that day and in fact a serb general was convicted for this um by the international criminal tribunal of the former yugoslavia and it concluded that it was a deliberate strike by serb forces against uh, civilians that ruling was was upheld on appeal um but i think that it, even even without reaching any conclusion about what did or didn't happen you can see that that kind of murkiness and uh, is present in the Ukraine war today. So you know we have seen we have seen so many occasions whereby a strike on a 
a ostensibly civilian infrastructure such as the late March Maria Paul um, Maternity Hospital uh, bombing, or was it an airstrike? We don't know. Uh, this was framed as a deliberate Russian strike on a, on civilian infrastructure, and we were told that this was just you know the latest example of how Russia is fighting a totally genocidal war against all things Ukraine and Ukrainian. However, you know, in, in that incident alone, it seems fairly clear that parts of that hospital were illegally occupied by um, Azov Battalion and Ukrainian armed forces. This is a war crime. Um, Amnesty called uh, this practice out as one. It's very widespread on the Ukrainian side. Um, you know, but like it, 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 in, in, at least in the International Court of Public Opinion, Russia is thoroughly convicted of having you know, deliberately struck a maternity hospital because it's a maternity hospital. Now, there, are, there is a huge push all over the West for a similar body to the International Criminal Tribunal of Yugoslavia uh, to be set up to prosecute Russian officials. This was also tried um, in Syria, uh, um, and I mean, it failed miserably, not least because Syria didn't lose. But, you know, it is, and yes, it seems likely that, that Russia will prevail in this conflict. But, I mean, at the very least, there will, it seems, be a legal entity created which will, uh, you know, hear evidence and, and and prosecute and convict people. And it's very important to bear in mind that, yes, what we're being told is, is happening on the front line is probably going to inform those findings because the, the, the entire exercise will be designed to reinforce you know, political and media narratives on what it on what's happening in Ukraine, um, and you know the, the people are going to get caught by this. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it, it's it, there's that saying, uh, a lie can travel ar around the world um, but before the truth has, has got its shoes on. I mean, you know, and 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 that's important to bear in mind because while the US isn't, you know, at least theoretically directly involved in this, in future wars between the US and whoever is probably China, we're probably going to be told a lot about Chinese atrocities, and this will be used as a justification for further escalation, um, for further intervention, for more bloodshed. And it, 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 it's clear, you know, from these files that any event that happens will be weaponized in order to, to suit an underlying narrative. Yeah, well, I mean, it's already on as far as that goes. You got a whole genocide going on in China with no bodies. They raised the quota on how many kids Uyghurs are allowed to have and still just call it genocide and call it whatever they want. And speaking of which, so this goes from uh, to the Kosovo War is the Rasak massacre, however you pronounce that, which did not happen. And I wonder mm -hmm. about, you know, in Bosnia, how many of those where you just have completely fake uh, massacres. And I know that there are the accusations on both sides of Srebrenica are, you know, extreme. Either the Serbs slaughtered 8,000 people for fun and profit and land, I guess, or... They didn't, and that's a complete hoax. I wonder if these Canadian files shed any insight on that. Well, yeah, I, 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 mean, I, I, I maybe mean, overstated sorry. that. I should say that the the other side of the story is that the AP says that there are 8,000 missing, but most of them had fled rather than had been killed. That there may have been some who were killed, but not 8,000 and not 8,000 civilians for sure. So sometimes I get a little carried away. Go ahead. Yeah, no, sure. I mean, I think that, that, that there are there are references to Srebrenica. Um, they they you know, they they talk of a a large scale massacre um, in, in in that area. They don't use that those kind of numbers. I mean, although I do think that the you know, the, the numbers are almost secondary to the circumstances in which this happened. It's quite clear. I mean, yes, we have all of these references to provocations from the Serbs. Um, uh, sorry, against the Serbs uh, in order to trigger a. Um, uh, in order to trigger an overreaction, um, and it, it, when when you look at the you know, references in these files to to Sebrenica in conjunction with British Army peacekeeper uh, documents, which are public domain, they're available at the, uh, the National Archives in London. They um, the British recorded how they felt that there was a deliberate attempt to um, uh, compel the Serbs to kill civilians in in Srebrenica, and they note that the town was abandoned by the military in advance of uh in advance of Serb troops arriving there now 
again, um, you know, one needn't say, you know, run the risk of of um, of uh, atrocity denial to say that quite clearly this was not simply a matter of yes, Serbs just for the you know just for shits and giggles and and then the kick of it because they are these you know genocidal barbarians slaughtered eight thousand people for fun for fun. Um, you know, there are there is a context there. Um, it may, maybe nothing could ever, you know, palliate or or um uh relativize a slaughter um of, of such a scale. But you know, again, you know, this has been the subject of um numerous investigations, the ICTY's ruling that this was a um that, that this genocide was controversial at the time. The ICTY admits better, well, at least one of the the judges, there were dissenting, there was dissent within the ICTY's ranks on what actually happened and whether it was a genocide. Um, even one of the judges who signed off on that conclusion said that we we effectively played fast and loose with the definition of genocide in order to come up with this conclusion. Now, anyone in at least in the mainstream, making the argument that well, maybe this wasn't a genocide, maybe it was just, you know, a a a targeted killing that resulted from provocation in the context of a civil war is branded a genocide denier up there with those who deny that there were gas chambers uh, in concentration, Nazi concentration camps. You know, and it, 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 it substance and spin become inseparable. And so, again, this has very obvious relevance to, you know, the conflict today. I mean, we're told that this is a genocide and it, but it, it, that is, it, this, this persists in the media now, despite the fact that, according to UN figures, the civilian death toll is, is 9,000. Now, I mean, you know, one is too many, you might argue, but that's not a genocide. In fact, actually, you know, compared to US intervention, that's a remarkably low figure. Yeah, well, I think it's luckily refugees had somewhere to go. And so for the most part are out of the way of the worst of the fighting there. But, you know, it's clear that too, that, you know, they came up with a narrative called a PSYOP or whatever, I guess, if you want, but it was certainly a major media and government narrative right around March and April last year that it's a genocide and not just that, but the whole, you know, kind of story around that was you can't negotiate with evil, right? Now it's Dick Cheney and Saddam Hussein because uh, the Russians are so bad that how could you say that the Ukrainians should negotiate with them, make any concession to them when they're proving themselves to be these inhuman barbarian orcs and all of this kind of thing. And then that worked. It was right then was when negotiations were ongoing and they were making real progress and the British and the Americans were trying to stop them. And I don't know exactly what happened in Buka there, but hundreds of people were killed. That's not genocide. It's nothing like you would think of the Gestapo comes to town and rounds up all the Jews in the town square and machine guns them to death or some kind of thing. It was nothing like that, but they just framed it that way and then it worked. And here we are, you know, 10 months later, talking about the same damn war still. Indeed, indeed. And I, I mean, I mean, Buka is a, 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 what's really interesting as well is I wrote an article in April, um, not making any uh, you know, concrete conclusions, but you know, pointing out numerous anomalies around Buka. So for instance, the fact that there was no massacre reported until uh, an Azov cleanup squad, who was meant to root out saboteurs and um, collaborators, was deployed to the city when the Russians were long gone, and you know offic officials like the mayor had, had returned, but they didn't say anything about bodies lying in the street. And um, you know that that's clearly an anomaly which got rather you know, ignored in the mainstream media. But what, what's really striking is that as the war has gone on, and particularly after Ukraine's successful counteroffensive, where they they kind of carved through effectively abandoned um, and unguarded uh, territory that, were, that had been cap captured by the Russians, and this was you know hailed as you know the courageous um, lion-like Ukraine and, and blah 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 blah, but you know, in the Western media, um, in uh, you know following those successful incursions. There were widespread reports in the media about, uh, and this was being praised as well, of, of Ukrainian soldiers 
uh, you know, rounding up collaborators, hunting them down and you know, brutally punishing them. There are videos of these people being you know, shot and thrown into pits, um, you know, which is very, very grisly. I don't recommend anyone watches them. But, you know, so it, 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 I, my article on, on, on Buka was dismissed as, yes, a kind of genocide denying, um, you know, conspiracy theory, blah, 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 blah. Um, uh, but then, you know, now the mainstream media has in, has embraced and endorsed the idea that actually it's a good thing that massacres of collaborators happen. That's what I was suggesting, you know, back in, in March and April, and I was slammed for it. And then now it seems to just be accepted that Ukraine does this. Well, if they did this in Kherson or, you know, Zaporizhia, um, why did they not do it in Bukha? And there's another interesting wrinkle in this is that, you know, Seth Hart, who's a bit of a, a dissident mainstream journalist, um, I, you know, he, um, he gave an interview to my friend Aaron Mate, where he talked about how, um, well, you know, when he, he he went in, he went to Ukraine wanting nothing more than to expose Russian war crimes, um, and then he conducted numerous uh, uh, interviews with locals who said that oh, actually, the Russians left us alone or gave us food, like you know, they didn't, they, 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 they weren't interested in coming after us. Uh, and you know every you know every time a patrol went past, they'd like wave and and, and everything. They're very professional and friendly. Um, and, but then you know Seth Harp also believes that Buka was a massacre by the Russians, except he just can't think of any reason why they would do it, and admits that this is completely out of character for them. So I just think that even on the dissident side of the media, um, and, you know people who are seeing with their own eyes that this stuff isn't true, one way or another, they've drunk that Kool Aid. And you know, they're, they're so far ensconced in the propaganda matrix that it, even though they can't justify this narrative based on personal experience, they're still tied to it, which is an interesting phenomenon. Yeah. Hey, guys, check out my new sponsor. It's Peacehawk Coffee at peacehawk.coffee. First of all, business. You have to drink coffee in the morning and you want it to taste good. Well, Peacehawk Coffee is the best from around the world. But then, just as important... Peacehawk Coffee donates at least a dollar of every pound sold to worthy foreign aid organizations like Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation. When you buy Peacehawk Coffee, you're not only buying great coffee, you have a chance to support the economies of countries struggling against the effects of war and support private aid foundations doing life-saving work abroad. Sign up for their email list and get yourself some great coffee at peacehawk.coffee. Hey, y'all, Scott Horton here for the Libertarian Institute at libertarianinstitute.org. I'm the director. Then we've got Sheldon Richmond, Kyle Anzalone, Keith Knight, Lori Calhoun, Jim Bovard, Connor Freeman, Will Porter, Patrick McFarlane, and Tommy Salmons on our staff, writing and podcasting. And we've also got a ton of other great writers, too, like Walter Block, Richard Booth, Boss Spleet, Kim Robinson, and William Van Wagenen. We've published eight books so far including my latest, Hotter Than the Sun, Time to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, and Keith Knight's new Voluntarist Handbook. And we've got quite a few more great ones coming soon. Check out libertarianinstitute.org slash books. It's a whole new era. We libertarians don't have the power, but we do have enough influence to try to lead the left and the right to make things right. Join us at libertarianinstitute.org. Well, you know, I got to plead ignorance on this one just because I have not done a deep dive on it yet. But I know that there's a new New York Times or relatively new New York Times documentary that supposedly shows it was the Russians. But I also know a guy, I won't say who because he's still working on it, but I know a guy who sure writes some really good stuff sometimes who has done his own investigation on what happened there and uh, seems to think that it was the Ukrainians and not the Russians that did it, although, well, I shouldn't say more about his narrative from just what I heard so far, but uh, I think it is, you know, certainly debatable, but what's certainly not is that it was almost like they coined a new phrase to use, like a color-coded thing, not that it's a new term, but they just used genocide as their, you know, brand that they were pushing for that, you know, two, three, four week period there in March and April to make sure to essentially characterize negotiations with Russia as immoral appeasement of Hitler instead of the proper and, and prudent thing to do to try to save as many lives as possible. Since 
at the end of the day, as Milley has implied, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Ukraine's losing the Donbass. You know, maybe or maybe not about whether they can negotiate over Kherson and Zaporozhye, but they're losing Donetsk and Luhansk, you know, at the end of this thing, you know, regardless. So why drag the thing out? And of course, we know because that's the strategy. But it just like with Bosnia, we're talking about there are these great quotes. I'm not sure. I don't think this is from your reporting, but I'm sure you're familiar with it, that the difference between the Lisbon deal and Dayton was two years and 200,000 bodies that all the Americans did was delay the pretty much same system from being implemented. And we're going to end up pretty much just like we left uh, 20 years of war in Afghanistan with the Taliban back in power. We all pretty much know where this war is going to end up. If we don't all die in a thermonuclear holocaust, it's going to end up with the Russians absorbing the far east of Ukraine. Shrug. Yeah, I mean, I think that the you know, what, whatever comes of uh, you know, whatever the result of this war is, it will be a lot less favourable to Kiev than the March and April accords. Uh, pro you know, the proposals were, um, which would have seen um, Russia withdraw from all of the country and Luhansk and Donetsk be you know, independent uh, republics, and the Minsk uh, accords upheld. Um, but I mean, I think as well that it, 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 what's interesting is that the I mean, the war propaganda, propaganda has been very 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 effective and if you look at there was a recently published poll which showed that overwhelmingly i think it was it was overall about 68 percent of europeans it might be even higher thought that there was no chance that russia could win this and you know that i mean that they have been fed a steady diet since day one of ukrainian heroism success and russian embarrassment and failure um i think that a lot of people uh are going to be in for a shock when this does come to an end, which could actually be quite soon because the Ukrainians have run out of weapons and ammunition and the West either doesn't want to send or has none to send in response. So, you know, it, it, it actually, I mean, I, I, admittedly, it's a bunch of idiots on the internet, but I mean, the, the New York Times recently published an article, which I drew attention to on Twitter, which painted an absolutely desperate, grave picture of what was happening on the front line uh in eastern ukraine mm. you know we're talking about um a, a fields full of ukrainian bodies you know overflowing hospitals with corpses and injured people with the absolutely gruesome injuries of people missing limbs eyes you know um the, the parts of their bodies have been oh it's an artillery tiny. war man i mean it's just, oh, yeah, yeah. people being blown to bits it's just, it's just horrific yeah. horrific and it, it you know just is so so disturbing and you know, in the comments section, when the New York Times published it on Twitter, it was all people saying, this is fake news. Russia is losing. How can this be true? Like, you know, oh, like, uh, you know, has, has Putin infiltrated the NYT editorial board? And it's like, you know, already stacks are starting to appear. The media is, is changing tack. Now, on top of the fact that, yes, that Ukraine's situation seems completely desperate and hopeless, there is the fact that it, there is an increasing push within the US power structure to uh, get the hell out of Dodge in respect of Ukraine. So there was a report by Rand published recently, and Rand is, of course, a Pentagon-funded think tank, which uh, you know, reflects elite thinking and, and policy. And it said, uh, it effectively said, yes, that, well, the benefits from the, the war in Ukraine are actually very small. There's no way Ukraine can win. The longer this goes on, the more the, the more defenseless European armies will be. The longer this goes on, um, the more economically destroyed Ukraine will be. I mean, it's already dependent on entirely dependent on Western aid to keep its lights on. And it can't even do that because of Russian bombing of um, you know, electricity generators. Um, so you know, it actually makes a lot of sense to get out of this and start laying the foundations for that happening. Now, so on the one hand, you have a potentially um, uh, you know, rapid Russian advance um, in the offing. You also have the US empire preparing to throw these poor people under a bus, as they were always going to do. And it's why I always started this. Um, I pleaded for a negotiated settlement and, you know, was against sending vast amounts of weaponry to Kiev. Um, you know, I think that people might be shocked at how quickly Western leaders, particularly in the US, turn their backs on Ukraine. I think they'll be wondering why is this not in the news anymore?
why you know uh why are we not hearing these kind of daily self-righteous condemnations of yes the kind of Man, and i'm sorry to say kip but i mean Putin. yeah this is the best case scenario right the worst case scenario is like mearsheimer says that they just double down that they refuse to admit that they've been lying this whole time that this hasn't been working and then they start sending in troops yeah yeah i mean funnily enough like you know, that was one of the reasons that Rand said you know get the hell out of there because again as people like myself and um, my co colleagues at the gray zone have been warning this could very very easily spill into a direct us slash nato war with russia which would just be you know apocalyptic in scale it could very easily lead to nuclear exchanges um you know i mean it, 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 and this is this is why as as much as i am fairly certain that the that throwing under the bus will commence in 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 due course and sooner than we may think you know when the us says that they are not opposed to the idea of of crimea being demilitarized but you know whether optionally or by force i mean options optionally is never going to happen um or yeah, by force you know giving the ukrainians weaponry to to target the island i mean it, it's sorry that the peninsula um it, 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 you know i mean this is crazy talk because russia has said it will not use nuclear weapons unless there is a direct strike on russian territory and our interests are threatened now striking crimea which is you know historically culturally linguistically uh, uh, Russian as can be and always and has been uh, for centuries. I mean, and, and is viewed very much as a fundamental part of Russia. I mean, yes, that's going to, that would trigger a nuclear assault. Which, and by the way, I mean, Antony Blinken, for all of his faults, has at least conceded that. Uh, Politico yes. reported he was on a conference call the other day and he goes, well, I don't know about Crimea. You got to understand that's a red line for Russia. Yeah, well, these are the same people who say, Look, we have to send home dead Russian bodies, corpses, coffins, body bags. That's the only way to get through to these people. Sink their flagship, kill their generals. And then they go, well, you don't want to take Crimea, though. Well, maybe killing their generals is a red line, too. You ever think of that? Can you imagine if the Russians had been pouring billions of dollars into back Al-Qaeda in Iraq uh, and that they were targeting American officers at the highest levels? And mm. and getting them and what the Americans would have done. George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, they'd have nuked Moscow. Yes, precisely. So, and it's like, you know, I saw a I saw an art, I saw an article, I think it was published today, um, or I, I at least saw it today. It was on on CIA NN and it was about how um the, the West's hardest task in Ukraine is convincing Putin he's losing. I mean, my immediate reaction was, I mean, it, you know, it's convincing him he's dying and he's, you know, we hear that that every week as well, mm -hmm. um, that he's got some, you know, form of cancer or, or other, you know, uh, fatal disease, um, a, 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 you know, based on anonymous intelligence officials, of course. But yeah, I mean, it just, it just strikes me that I think that everyone involved in this is actually thinking more about media impact and is thinking you know about uh, uh, in every way um and you know therefore um it, yeah the, you know something like the ukraine's the ukrainians killing um uh, a russian general is something that they can you know use to sell ongoing arms shipments ongoing financial support because hey look at how far look at how well they're doing um, you know, it 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 it, it, it just it, it brings to mind this image of you know, like you know, Russian troops in 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 bombed out, flattened Paris, saying it's a pity we lost the information war. You know, I mean, I think that 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 notion that there's a physical component now to information warfare rather than just manipulating people um, is 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 very very real. Um, you know, we saw this with Daria Dugin. Um, we saw this with Kurt Bridge, and you know, what was the response to Kurt Bridge? Oh, a, a saturation bombing campaign, which hasn't stopped since then. You know, we're into the fifth month of this, with right. every region of the Ukraine getting hit, hit on an almost daily basis, and you know, untold numbers of civilians suffering horribly as a result. All right, now let's go back to the early to mid '90s here. I want to make sure that we uh, hit every major point on Bosnia. Yes that um, we need to know here, and especially new revelations. I mean, I think it's important, as we talked about before, that, um, you know, the Americans were the ones screwing up the peace, and here you have the um, Canadian peacekeepers themselves saying that that's true in these secret papers, that, you know, America's getting in the way of the peace deal, right? 
Yeah, yeah, precisely. And it's, I mean, I think that, you know, again, it's a similar kind of mentality to now. That they, they just wanted Yugoslavia destroyed because it was too successful an independent alternative system um, in a world which was, you know, it was this was meant to be the new American century, right? This was meant to be dominated by the success of freedom globally. I and mean, we've seen how that turned out. But, you know, yeah. The, 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 well, and by the, the way, was, for, was, for, was, for younger people who aren't aware, you know, it was a communist country, but it was not occupied by russian troops and it was not part of the soviet union it was just sort Indeed. of like loosely aligned with the eastern bloc kind of thing yeah and it, i mean it, you know it, it was part of the non-aligned movement which was a collection of countries that said you know neither moscow nor washington um it yes it, it was a troublesome uh, it had a troublesome uh, uh tendency towards autonomy it had its own uh, it, you know, it, it created most of its own goods. It had its own, you know, vehicle industry, pharmaceuticals, you know, pretty much every, everything they made uh, within their own borders. And this was, you know, the, the, the sanctions destroyed this. And, you know, I mean, I live in Belgrade now and, I, you know, and you walk around and you see you know, th there are still you know, bombing ruins and there are you know, uh, often homeless people with you know, very, you know, uh, life changing industry uh, in, in injuries from, from that conflict. Um, it, it's, it's, it's really quite disturbing. And a lot of the places that were bombed heavily in in place of you know the 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 uh the debris and the wreckage which remained kind of untouched for a decade after the bombing in 2000 um have you know the, like shopping malls and expensive luxury apartment blocks have been erected this was about imposing neoliberal capitalism at the you know at the end of the gun and boy did it well at least temporarily work um, you know, I mean, well, you know, I, 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 something tells me, or you know, maybe it's just my hope that it won't be successful long term. But yes, I mean, the US was consistently interfering and intervening to keep this going as long as possible and to ensure it was grinding as long as possible. And I think that actually, it's a, I, 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 again, a, a modern parallel. I think it was expected that that Russia would go the way of Yugoslavia. That you know there would be queues of people. Um, there would be people who, who couldn't access you know, you know, basic medicine, dying, you know, dropping dead in the street, and that there would be the other Russia would would break into a million pieces. Again, more manageable, more easy to exploit, and this would be the end of Putin, and that's backfired. I mean, the Bosnian files, if nothing else, show are a snapshot of a time when the US was you know om almost omnipotent you know it could it, 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 it could do anything it wanted and you know another another wrinkle in this to consider is i mean currently alex saab i mean who's a, a, a venezuelan diplomat who hel helped caracas import food um uh in, in breach of these crippling sanctions which have been imposed on, on venezuela for many years have killed you know tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of people um it, you know it, 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 he's he's in jail now uh, and facing trial for um help you know for sanctions busting um it, 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 like i mean i don't it, it seems that people who are uh, and in in sorry in the Yugos, in the Yugoslav war well the Yugoslav war was ongoing um the chess champion bobby fisher played a match in Yugoslavia and the us attempted to deport him from japan and he spent the best part of a year in a windowless cell um, as a result, um, you know, for playing a chess match in a sanctioned country, I think that you know we're not seeing similar um, action being taken against you know many countries which are directly or indirectly skirting the sanctions on Russia. I think this is the you know while you know, Bosnia was a a uh, the Bosnian conflict was a, a palpable demonstration of the power of Pax Americana. I think the war in Ukraine could be a demonstration of its uh, of its ultimate decline. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of that going around. All right. Now, listen, uh, we only got about four minutes before I got to run to my next interview here. But you've got uh, this important piece that you wrote on your sub stack. And if I was wise enough to page down a little bit, I could read my own footnote. And um, no, nope, it must be on the next page. I'm not going to find it. Anyway, it's at your sub stack. And it's all about the NED and George Soros and USAID and, of course, the International Republican Institute and the National Democratic Institute and um, ooh, the uh, uh, Omidyar, of course, uh, uh, network. Yes. And how they these guys had all bankrolled and pushed the Maidan revolution of uh, 2014. So there are a lot of aspects to that coup. Uh, but we're short on time, so I'm going to be quiet, but talk about this most important part 
the foreign intervention on the side of the so-called revolution here? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's difficult. I mean, when you say intervention, this was a long time coming. The, the NED was behind the 2004 Orange Revolution. Um, the, the, you know, this was uh, where uh, a, a pretty much straight up CIA coup, except not delivered by the CIA. They bust in protesters. They taught people in, you know, in violent um, uh, demonstration tactics that overthrew the government. And it led to uh, the election of a Western backed candidate who was so unpopular due to his pro so pro privatization policies that he was, was roundly defeated in an absolute landslide by Viktor Yankovic in 20, uh, 2010, I believe. Um, and then, yes, yeah. um, the, the such was the anger of, of uh, the NED at this that they started pumping in many, many, many more millions and um, you know, are ramping up their efforts considerably just six months before, May, before Maidan. Uh, Carl Gershman, the longtime head of NED, wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post in which he talked about how his organization was helping overthrow um, pro-Russian governments in the former Soviet Union. And he referred to a Ukraine as, quote unquote, the grand prize. Um, and then, yes, six months later, the Maidan, which was led by individuals and organizations in direct receipt of funding from the NED, uh, um, it, 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 it is successful. Um, you know, there's a fantastic uh, interview between Lukashenko, the Belarusian leader, and the BBC reporter. And he said, we will destroy all your NGOs. Um, and yes, that would have been wise. And I think that any country in the world that wants to avoid going the way of Ukraine over the past two decades uh, would be wise to ban any and all US funded NGOs from their territory. Yeah, for real. And um, uh, anyway, people should look at this. I'm sorry, we're, we're so short on time here. But it's amazing that they do that. I mean, you listen to the American uh, media or British media like Reuters, they'll say, it's just an outrage that Putin is... Uh, registering, not just the, not even kicking everyone out of the country, but he's going to make them register as foreign agents before they do any lobbying and participation in Russian civil society. What an outrage. But we have a law just like that. And all of us regular yes. people wish that they would enforce it when instead all of Washington, D.C. are essentially foreign agents, completely suborned and bribed and paid out in the open. Um, but, uh, yeah, as Putin has said, yeah, pretty hard to be a sovereign nation when you got foreign governments throwing that much weight around in your electoral process. It's kind of just a fraud, even on the face of it. Uh, but uh, the footnote there is anatomy of a coup, how CIA front laid foundations for Ukraine war. And that's at Kit's newsletter at kitclarenberg.substack.com. A real good one. A great addition to my collection. And um, also, uh, this one's in the book, too. Expo oh, well, actually, this is, too. Before, I forgot about it uh, before, but it is. Uh, before Ukraine blew up the Kerch Bridge, British spies plotted it. That was another good one that we don't have time to talk about. And then declassified intelligence files expose inconvenient truths of the Bosnian War. This is a really important contribution to the history of that American intervention and and you know, allied intervention there. So uh, really appreciate it. Really appreciate your time on the show here, Kit. My pleasure, Scott. Thanks for having me on, my friend. Take care. Speak again. All right, you guys, that's Kit Clarenberg. Check him out at The Gray Zone, thegrayzone.com. The Scott Horton Show, Anti-War Radio, can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in LA. APSradio.com, antiwar.com, scotthorton.org, and libertarianinstitute.org.